Brilliant. Okay, welcome everybody. How lovely to see you all. Um, so today's session is all about leadership. And I hope that you did have a chance to um, actually look at your exercise sheet that we sent you. There's a great exercise in there. And, you know, I think you must just be honest and truthful to yourself. And there's no shame in, you know, whether you are a manager at this point in your life or whether you are a leader, because, you know, you've got to move from the one to the other. And I think that what's important is just understanding the difference between, you know, being a manager and actually being a, a leader. And I just want to go through some of those um some of those traits with you, because I think it is actually quite important. So a manager, and when we, as entrepreneurs, when we start our businesses, you know, we have to cope with complexity. We have to understand, you know, the complexities of our business. And I think that that's really important. But once you, you move into more of a leadership role, and obviously that's what we are wanting for you. We are wanting you to, you know, move into more of a leadership role where you are hiring people, and you are creating a business with value. And if that isn't your goal and that isn't your aim, that's absolutely fine with us as well. But you know, this course is designed to help you build a business. If you've created a job for yourself, that's fine. If you've created a business with value, um, this is where we are wanting to take you on this journey. Because in my belief, and this is only me, I wanted, to, if I was going to work this hard for so long, I wanted to have created an asset in my life. I wanted to create a business with value that one day I could sell on to somebody else and go and retire or, you know, live comfortably for the rest of my life. So that's why, you know, it's so important to lay the foundations, you know, understand leadership, understand what you need to do. So a manager copes with complexity, whereas a leader copes with change okay and I can't tell you how many you know how important that is to understand that change is good change is absolutely you know inevitable as you grow your business and you need to be able to cope with that and a lot of people don't like change but you know it's I mean look what's happened to us this year and I mean I can't help but, but say that you know we've had to cope with massive change and I have to be honest with you you know in the 22 years that I've had my business this has probably been the most I've learned, the most I've grown, and the most I've had to really change my business and change almost myself and my and my you know some of the things that I've that I've done in my life just to you know enable me to cope. I found for myself my highs are higher and my lows are lower because I don't have that um, that almost that routine in my life. Get up, go to work you know, sit in an office, have my team around me, learn from each other, have those side meetings. So there's been a lot of change that has had to happen for me, for my team. And I think we've really had to, and we've seen um, us as the leadership team in, my, in um, our EXCO team, have seen the, the staff that have really been able to cope with the change and others who've really, really struggled. And we've tried to put things in place for them to help them cope because not a lot of people can, well, certainly some of my junior staff have really, really struggled with this change because you've had, you have to self-motivate, you know, I mean, one of the big things for me, and I mean, I'm a happy, positive person 90% of the time, but, you know, I've, I've also had to self-motivate myself. It's nice and easy to stay in bed, have that extra cup of coffee, you know, be a little bit more lazy if my first meeting's only at 10, but that self-motivation and um, you know, coping with this change has been a, a big learning point for me. Um, so a manager works within the status quo. So you know, this is the business, this is what it is, and we'll work within that status quo. Whereas a leader will challenge that and you know, push the boundaries. What is, you know, what is the next thing that we can do in our business that's going to bring revenue, that's going to challenge the, the status quo. A couple of years ago, we were quite stuck with our events and, um, and marketing. Then we were like, what is the next big thing? What is happening in the market? What are the trends? What's happening? And we realized that activations were becoming a very big part of what brands wanted to do. And within a year, we'd, we'd almost done, I think it was, we, we 
set an intention, we're going to start doing activations, and activations now is probably about 30% of our business. And in fact, we, as in lockdown, as I think you know, we actually won the um, Vodacom account for activations in the Western Cape. So we really put an intention on that five years ago to become recognized as an, as an agency that does activations. I mean, none of that's happening now. So that's also something, how do we then turn that into a more digital experience? So all those things, you have to challenge the status quo and, um, and be able to cope with that. A manager will ask what, and a leader will ask why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? A manager will plan for the short term. So I often say to my Manco team, what's happening in the next three, six, three months, six months, and 90 days. And I'm sure, you know, Dawn probably had a lot of managers that were planning for those short term. But it's our responsibility as leaders, as my exco team, to plan for that year, three years, and five years. And that can be quite hard because we don't know what's coming down the line. But, you know, it's the things that we do today that will start, you know, we're thinking of now developing a, an online platform for experiences. That's not going to take us five minutes, but that's something that we have to get involved in online platforms, e commerce, and, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? you know, 10 years ago, when's the second best time now? So what are the things that we're going to do today to start future-proofing our business to ensure that we're going to stay relevant and be relevant as the, as the, um, the world changes? So you've got to ensure that you're watching trends and seeing what's happening around you. And one of the best tips that I ever got for that was see what your children are doing. Watch what your children are doing. And, you know, gaming and online and um, you know cell phones and apps and all of that this is such a massive part of of their lives and I mean Dawn talks uh, has a talk just on you know digital transformation and the fourth industrial re revolution and the internet of things you really have to watch what your children are doing so we also pitching for gaming shows having a look at how that's going to affect the African landscape so just see what these kids are doing and, and I'm telling you now follow them um, a manager will organize his, organize his people, organizes their teams, whereas a leader will align everybody, make sure everybody's aligned and make sure that you're all, you know, pulling towards the same vision. A manager will administrate and control, where a leader will motivate and inspire. So I think that's also a question, you know, are you motivating and inspiring your team or are you just administrating and controlling? Manager will focus on systems and structures whereas a leader will focus on their people. I am, um, and we will, we actually have a whole section on this, so I'm not even gonna spoil that for now. A manager will follow the vision, where the leader will communicate and deliver on the vision and the values. So in, um, in our business, I'm the one that is, this is our vision to be a global agency, inspiring connections, and these are the values that we live by. This is, we, we live and die by this, and we are always the ones that are making sure that all of that is aligned because that obviously builds culture in a team. And then the last one, a manager will work in the present, whereas, um, as I said earlier, a leader will very much look into the future. So what do you understand about leadership? And I think because there's quite a nice small group this morning, which is, which is um, nice, there's probably eight of you on, online. Um, what do you understand about leadership? And maybe just put it in the chat box and let's just have a little conversation about, you know, what do you think leadership is and, and how do you define yourself as a leader? And remember, it's not only in your company. And if you are a company of one, that's fine. What are your leadership in your family? What leadership skills do you have in your community? Because I think it's more than just, um, you know, leadership in a business. I think there's, you can show leadership in so many walks of life. So what do you understand by leadership? Let me see if I can actually see this chat box. If I am sharing my screen. Oh, here we go. Are you chatting to me or are you not chatting to me? Chat. Oh, there we go. Yes. Being able to take in intelligent risks to grow and inspire and motivate. Oh, Kirti, I like that. Yes, that's like holding the vision. Very nice. Okay, nice. And there are so many, um, there are so many definitions for leadership. So we just created something that was nice and easy. A leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. And it's just a nice, fun um, way of 
you know, sort of communicated, knows the way, so we know where we're going. We go the way, so we lead by example, and we show everybody, you know, how it's done. Okay. So something that... Can also, I add? Yes, yeah, can I add Please go, yeah. 100%. So, 100%. hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Hello. I'm going to hop in and out today, sorry. But I also think that what is important is that um, there's a great saying that... Um, I think it's, um, I think Jack Welsh has a great saying. He says, you know, being a leader um, is about, you know, growing yourself and, and your success. But being a great leader is about growing the success of others. others. And, and I think that's very powerful. Um, and leadership to me, um, as Les says, it's not just about leading people. It's about, you know, family, um, you know, being a leader in the family. And although in a lot of families, you've got a mother and father and you take joint leadership roles, um, but, but it's also about leading yourself. And I think that to me is the most critical. If you're not leading and if you're not showing inner leadership. So leadership, there's external leadership and there's internal leadership. And I think the internal leadership, if you wake up and if you're not leading yourself, as Les said, and that there's a difference between motivating and leading. Leading yourself, not only to get out of bed, because that's motivation, but leading yourself to, you know, achieve your vision. And if you're not leading yourself, you can't lead others. So I think the important thing is just, you know, ask yourself this question, am I leading myself? And, you know, how am I contributing to making the others around me successful? being that your children, being that your, um, your colleagues, your peers, how are you taking your leadership and really inspiring others um, through your leadership? Sorry, Les, just to add it. No, a hundred, no, please don't. I mean, we are absolutely, I mean, you've got so many beautiful stories to share, to share in, in this category. So, I mean, I think, you know, from a leadership point of view, you know, I learned from you. So I think also, it's also how are you showing up? And if I can just give you three points in things to remember is, you know, when you are showing up, you need to take, accept responsibility for yourself and everything and build up the courage to do things that you fear. And I think that that's, I remember um, also putting my own team on a, uh, a, on a leadership course and um, the facilitator at the time was, you know, how, what percentage, they actually asked the question to my entire, um, I think it was my management team, my Manco team, what percentage do you think that you're showing up in this business? And they had to be absolutely brutally honest. And I'm going to tell you an unbelievable statistic. And they all, you know, and, and we said, come on, guys, you know, be realistic. And they said, yeah, they were showing up at about 80%. You know, they, we, we averaged it out around about 80%. And guess what? At the end of the year, um, we missed our target by 20% because they were showing up 80% of the time and therefore we only got to 80% of our target. And so how are you showing up and how are you taking responsibility as a leader, I think is so important. And when we, after we trained them and we said, okay, guys, now we want you to really start showing up 100% of the time. And guess what happened the following year? It's unbelievable. And just, you know, taking responsibility for yourself and you will experience a crisis. And this is so funny. I mean, I'm actually re referring to, the, um, to our, our book that we wrote, our Entrepreneur's Playbook. And um, <laughs> this was written five years ago. You will experience a crisis. <laughs> and I actually laughed when I, when I went over my notes this morning. So when you come across a setback, an obstacle, um, you know, you have to demonstrate the kind of person that you are. And one of the big lessons that I learned, and I think, Dawn, this is going to resonate with you as well, is... Dawn and I have had to be quite different leaders in Over the Rainbow um, because we're small business owners actually in Over the Rainbow. Then we are, or for Dawn was, in her corporate life because, you know, that we, we were CEOs or I am a CEO in that life. And that is a very different leadership, you know, that's around inspiring your team. Whereas a small business owner is very different sometimes to you know, being an actual CEO of a very large company like Dawn was and a medium-sized company like I was. So you've also got to understand yourself and understand those different roles as well. And obviously, integrity and honesty. And 
when um, through this crisis, the one thing that I think that my team have been so grateful for is the transparency that we've shown and really just being absolutely like brutally honest with them when it came to salary cuts, when it came to finances, when it came to, you know, guys, the expenses are this big and the income at this point is this big. These buckets are not matching. We have to make a plan. And once we showed our vulnerability, showed that, you know, listen, we, we have to be in this together. We can't do this alone. People were willing to pay to take, you know, more pay cuts. We're willing to, you know, fight this fight with us and, you know, reach our goal, which was to save the business at all costs. So it's incredible that when you are vulnerable, that you you come up, you show up with, with honesty, that you build trust in your team as well. And um, how they've all, I have not had one resignation and they've all just really been in this with us. So it's been an incredible experience. And when we've really needed our team, they've been there for us. So just, and I think my point around this is, is knowing yourself. Now there's a very lovely, and I don't actually hire any more without using this tool. It's called the Gallup Strength Finder. And um, it got introduced to me and our business probably about 10 years ago. And um, it's such a, it, it's cost about $15, but I promise you it's absolutely worth every cent. And when I realized where everybody sat in my team it was so much easier than A, to put them in teams together when they were brainstorms, B, to understand what drove them and what motivated them, and C, then for me to enable me to build the right team around me, because I'm an influencer. Um, so what this test is, there are 36 personality traits whether you're a communicator or significance or achiever or a ranger or harmony or whatever, there are 36 personality traits. Your top five form 80% of your personality based on this Gallup Strength Finder. So um, I, I'm, I'm sure, Dawn, you're probably also quite a strong influencer. Um, where you know we're competitive, we look for potential, and then we like a maximizer is I think my, my number one strength communication. My second thing is relationship building. So I am um, about positivity, and I think my other one is um, developer. We actually like to develop people, and then apparently what actually saves me is I have one executes. Otherwise, um, according to the coach that that did this for us, I'd be a bit of a nightmare. I think I've got a chiva on the executing side but I don't have any strategy. And so it became very clear to me that I really needed a strategic thinker on my team. But it also became clear to me that I needed to surround myself with strong executors. Whilst I was quite a visionary, I needed a strong executing team. So when you know what your strength is, you can surround yourself with the right people to enable you to make that puzzle and move your business forward. Because there's no point in surrounding yourself with a whole lot of influences if you don't have the executors and you don't have the relationship people and the strategic thinkers, because there'll be, there'll be an imbalance. And um, obviously when you're small, just find the person either opposite you. So if you're an influencer, maybe that is the strategic thinker. But in my experience, that executor is a gem to have in a small business. They are what we call the GSD people. They get the stuff done. And uh, that, in my experience, anybody, and we actually did a, um, a, a survey on our top performing employees and the ones with responsibility as, well as one of their traits ended up being our top performing employees. Just a little side note, in our agency, I'm not saying that it worked for everybody, but in our agency, if you came up with responsibility, we probably hired you because those people take responsibility and they don't, they kind of, they're obsessed with um, making sure that everybody's happy. So it's great. So I really would encourage you. And if you do do this test and you want me to go through it with you and just, I've done the course, I understand this, uh, um, um, every single person in my team does this. I understand it. So if you want me to, I'm very happy to um, go through yours with you and just help you then, you know, making the decisions when it comes to, to um, hiring. Because you hire the wrong person, guys, and I've done that. It's costly, 
take you to the CCMA, you put the wrong bum on the bus in the, on the seat, and it is a nightmare. Uh, one quick story, I hired a driver once, amazing guy, absolutely incredible, he was so fun, he was amazing, and only afterwards, after he'd been there for months, two months, I said to my team, have we done a strength finder on this guy, because he just doesn't want to really do anything, he wants my job, and when we, when, and he was the most amazing guy, got a great, great personality, but he just didn't want to do anything, so big mistake, wrong person, um, even though he was a nice guy, but wrong personality fit, for the job he was doing. So, so important. Okay, so um, I'm going to move on because I think I've chatted quite a lot and it's now dawn's yes, turn. Can I just quickly add something Please. to that? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I think there's a lot of assessment tools, not only yeah. to assess your own um, skills as a leader or, or where your strengths and weaknesses lie, but also for that of your people. And I think what Les was alluding to just now, it's very important to fill the gap so that you know all the pieces of the puzzle fit together so that you don't have poor like-minded people in your team um, and and I know a lot of you may be one man shows and, and and don't employ a lot of people but I think as I said earlier it's important to know your own strength so that when you are building your business and you are employing people you've got people who complement like your weaknesses um, and I always use this Dr. Kubis Nethling tool where he looks at the two quadrants of the brain. In fact, there are four quadrants of the brain, but he looks at left brain, right brain. And there's a lot of debate whether left brain, light, right brain is also your EQ and your IQ. But um, I mean, there's a lot of um, research today that the great leaders are the ones with a high EQ, emotional intelligence, as opposed to IQ. But left brain, right brain, so, so left brain is somebody who's very factual, um, who, who is very logical, who thinks very clearly and is focused, very good at numbers, very good at statistics. And then your right brain person is somebody obviously more creative, um, more, you know, their, their emotional intelligence is higher, um, they're more innovative, they're more creative. Um, and, and I think it's important to know um, and to do the assessment, and I'll try and find it for you, because it's actually, you can do it online, to see what you are, because a lot of people think that they, they are right brain people. I mean, I worked with a lot of CAs. In fact, I surrounded myself with CAs, and then I had too many CAs, and they were driving me mad. Um, so I balanced it out a little bit. In fact, I had two actuaries working for me at one point of view. So it was this um, very intense um, left brain um, um, senior management team. But um, this, this, this exercise, Kurbus Nietling, Professor Kurbus Nietling, it really gives you the opportunity to really look at where your strength is. If you're a left or a right brain thinker, and then also to correct areas maybe of your weakness. Um, so for many of you running um, a, a business where you're the only person, it's important that um, you actually either fill up your head with things that you're not good at. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs are not good at the numbers. I mean, there are lots of courses to go on because I think as a leader, the most important thing is that you've got to know at a very high level everything about your business you've got to know as we spoke about the key drivers of your business so i think that um you need to do an assessment to see where you are where you sit in terms of leadership i was very fortunate that um about um eight years ago i studied at harvard business school i did the senior leadership um class called slp and it was it took me to the campus the harvard campus for three months and it was just, I mean, it was like leadership at, a, at, a, at, at, at another level. And um, I don't think that you need to go there, but I think you need to understand the basics of leadership. And there's just one more issue, um, Les, and I think we've covered a lot. So we'll skip through a lot of the rest of the points. But the other thing, um, you know, entrepreneurs say, but I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. And I think today, um, good entrepreneurs are not always good leaders. And it's a very important thing that you need to, to understand that entrepreneurs 
really like to hold on because it's their idea. They started the business. It's their idea. And they don't like letting go. And not letting go is the worst trait of a leader. So I think that where there are dysfunctions, um, if I can use that word, in the way you lead, I think you need to either prop it up with other people or go out and do a, a, a course or whatever. So there's also another book, Five um, Dysfunctions of, um, of, of Leadership. And they talk about, you know, you know, what do bad leaders do as opposed to look at what good leaders do. And I think if we can focus on both, it's, it's important, but communication was, was definitely one. And I think Les, that leads us into the first step, if I can maybe just go on to that point, because I think we've spoken about it, but it was the most important thing at Harvard in terms of where leaders fail, is they're not communicating um, with their team. And communication, you know, it doesn't have to be physical communication. In fact, I was doing, I was in a, um, in a session with a couple of business leaders the other day, and it, it was amazing to hear how different leaders of businesses really communicated throughout COVID with their people. There's some who became ostriches and put their head under the sand and didn't actually quite know what to do. And there are others who were telling people exactly the status quo. We are losing money. There's no revenue coming in. And, you know, other, you know, just being totally, totally honest with your people. I mean, that's, that's, the communication lesson is, is just tell everybody exactly what the situation is. If you're making a profit, if you're making a loss, we shared every single thing. I've always shared every single thing with the person at, at, like at grassroots level in the organization with their washing cars or cleaning windows. Um, I think it's important that people know how the business is performing. Um, so that's all through communication. Um, so communication obviously doesn't only um, inform people, but it also persuades and inspires people. And I think that's why we need to look at various forms of communication. So at um, Imperial and Europe Car and all the businesses that, that, um, that, I, that I started, um, I had a thing and I always had a, a thing called Ask Dawn. And it was on our internet and people could go and ask me any questions. There were a couple of rules. I mean, it was not salary related questions, um, but it is quite a nice way that you reach out to your staff um, and, and your people and know what's happening in the business. Um, so I didn't want to ever get involved in political things, but like, why are our rates going up? Or why are well, why don't we have this customer anymore? Or what is inside your head when you say our vision is to actually not grow next year, but to maintain and to retain, you know? So, so whatever, I think it really is great to get people um, minds opening up. And I think for me, communication, um, I don't think a, a leader must ever be the message um, or the messenger. Okay, I think that, that the leader needs to be both. So managers are messengers and leaders are, are, are messengers and the message. So you need to be the message and you need to be um, the messenger. And I also believe it's not as when you communicate, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. And I think yeah. that's, that's very important. And choose your words very, very carefully. Choose your language very, very carefully. Um, and, you know, if there's a serious message, you know, your voice tone needs to drop a little bit. If there's a strong, like motivating message. So communication is, is and really, really important. And today we're so blessed to have, you know, social media and, and so many ways that you can, you know, communicate. Um, and, and that's really um, what, what um a good leader does so it's it's very important i know i always keep up and go to my bookshelf and go and get it but I'll, I'll, by the end well les is going to talk now i'm going to get this book um and i'm going to show you and i'm going to actually go through some of the, the traits of dysfunctional leadership that actually can be used in your everyday life so i'm going to hop off while i get those and i'll share them with you when i come back on again les yeah brilliant thanks dawn 
But I also think it's, um, you know, of having communication channels and having communication rhythm in your, in your teams. When you build up your team, when you get to that point in your lives, or even if you are a one man um, at this point, a uh, business, you know, what are those things that you almost need to write down for yourself and have that rhythm set in your, I mean, we always have Monday morning meetings, so you know, to plan. And so how are you having those rhythms in your in your business or even to yourself so we have monday morning meetings we also have what we call month end so at the end of every month on a friday afternoon we then have a meeting to communicate everything that's happened in that month the project of the month the the rachel mate which is the person that's been um rated that's lived our values the best and you know what are the rhythms that you're creating in your business to ensure that your communication is good and then one last thing is understanding, and this is also regarding clients, understanding who your clients are and sort of the age that they are and the channels that they like to communicate on. Remember that millennials, for example, will opt for in internal communication tools like you know WhatsApps and that kind of thing. Whereas an older generation like myself, I actually like a phone call. To, you know, I, I, and I don't mind WhatsApp, but, you know, an email is a pain for me. So, you know, when people ask me, or even when you ask your clients, what is your best method of communication? Are you, you know, can I communicate with you on WhatsApp? Or some people think that's quite casual. Or, you know, is, or do you prefer emails? And I think just, you know, ha having that understanding will also help you to develop a better relationship with your clients. So just remember all those kinds of things, how people like to communicate as well. Okay, so number two, so number two is such a is um it, honestly this was a, such a tough lesson for me um in my early early days and and i think as entrepreneurs and and this is where it, you know you've got to realize the kind of person that you are um because i think sometimes we tend to hold on nobody can do it as well as we can do it and you know this is my baby i know what i'm doing and i built this and and it's so hard but you reach a point in your life that you realize if I'm not delegating, A, I'm robbing somebody else of the opportunity to learn and grow. So remember, if you are just holding on to doing all of those things, you are robbing somebody else of that opportunity. So you have to learn how to train them. You cannot grow your business unless you delegate. And probably about five or six years ago, again, I went to a talk and and this was one of the best things that I, that I ever heard and was like a slap in the face for me. Only do what only you can do and delegate the rest. Write it down. Only do what only you can do and delegate the rest. So if I'm getting involved in stuff that I should or should have delegated, I am not staying in my lane. That's actually a saying in our business as well is stay in your lane. So unless nobody else can deal with the bank. Nobody can do a merger deal. Nobody can go and look for opportunities overseas at this point in our business. So those are the things that I'm responsible for. But if it's going to a client meeting or if it's, you know, sending a pitch deck or, you know, if sitting in on a, on a pitch, unless it's at a very high level, I can totally delegate all of that now to my team. But in the early days, I remember literally ripping a telephone out of somebody's hand because they weren't saying something to the client the way I would. And when, um, when eventually I said what I wanted to say, and I was quite proud of myself, my staff member turned to me and said, if you ever, ever do that again, I will walk out of here. Um, because I just didn't give them the chance to you know, develop that relationship with the client because they weren't doing. So you've got to do it and let go, but make sure that you've trained them properly because um, it all goes down to that. You, they don't have to be you, but as long as they're getting the job done. And sometimes and often, and in fact, you know, they would actually end up doing it better than me. So yeah, learn to delegate and then train them and leave them alone. Massive les lesson that I learned and um, because without that, you can't grow your business. Okay, over to you, Dawn. Okay, right. So I found the book. It's the five um, dysfunctions um, of a team, and, and it relates all to leadership. It's a very, very good book. So the first one is lack of commitment and communication. Uh, sorry, lack of communication. 
then lack of trust um, or absence of trust, fear of, of conflict and avoidance of team accountability. So I thought that was quite, it's, it's an excellent book. I actually we had it as um, when I did my um, leadership course at Harvard and it was, it was amazing because um, quite a simple book to read but um, it, it really is it, it really is a great book. I mean, I, I, I read so many books and I'm always like flicking through one book and I actually go back and read them. And it's amazing with leadership. I think although leadership over the years has changed from very autocratic leadership to more consultative leadership um, and, you know, more sort of casual, not casual, but more relaxed environment where leadership in the past used to be about control. And control was power and they thought leadership was about power leadership was certainly not about power because actually the, the higher you go and the bigger your organization the more disempowered you are because the more you're empowering other people and you have boards and you have shareholders and you listed and you the more actually as a leader you have to lead people and um, not do the doing work but anyway i want to talk a little bit about um, lead by example and for me, um, the thing that worked for me is always walking the talk and always being be true to your message and live your message. It's no good saying, guys, we're going to do this and you do the exact opposite. And um, I'll never forget a story that, um, that happened to me a long time ago. And it, it might give you the wrong impression of me, but it, it certainly woke up my ideas about the power of the example, you know, as a leader, you put it on a pedestal and no matter how much you think or you don't think that people are watching your every move, they're watching your every single move. They watch what comes out of your mouth, what you do, what you wear. I mean, I could not believe like the one, like people said, oh, do you remember that meeting you had, Dawn? You had this blue jacket on, you had this, I'm like, what? So people do, as a leader, you put on this, this platform and people watch everything that you say and do and I'll never forget we were in a time of um, that really hectic cost cutting and you know we hadn't retrenched but we were really tightening our belts and as you know like every couple of years companies really need to actually tighten their belts and you know we don't obviously need a COVID situation because that's a bit drastic for all of us and has been but we need a, a, something to give us a wake up call. And it was one of, those, um, one of those times. But I had actually come into a little bit of money from shares that I sold overseas. And I actually bought myself my own money. I bought myself a new car. And I'll never forget, I drove and I, I parked the car and about three or four la days later, my secretary said to me, um, because she was like, amazing. You always need, you always need a culture ambassador in your organization. You always need near you somebody who's going to tell you what people are saying, not about you, but what is happening in the corridors on the corridors. You know, people are a little bit concerned. Obviously, people had assumed that the company had bought me this car. In the meantime, it was a secondhand car. And you know what? It's such a small thing, but it's such a big thing to other people. And I made sure that like I didn't actually drive this car into my parking bay in the morning and thank God I hadn't sold my other car because it just creates the wrong impression. So um, walk walk the talk. Um, and yeah, I mean, I used to wash cars if we were ever busy and right up until maybe three or four years before I left, if, if we were busy, I would certainly go out to our Tambo airport and help them. It was absolutely my passion because the, the higher you grow in an organization, the, the, the more divorced you, you, you are of your core business. And you don't ever want to be in that situation where you're sitting in your big chair and you think like, what business am I in? You forget the business you're in. So I think it's very important to walk the talk and, you know, do what you expect others to do. Take res responsibility. And then also um, great leaders. And I think we've seen that in... Um, in, in many, many, um, many times, I think Sean Summers, great leaders, if they do make a mistake or if there's something um, that happens in the organization, that they apologize and they take ownership um, of the situation. 
think we remember, I think Bill, Lynch, Bill um, Clinton was one of the first people in the world to actually stand up and apologize uh, to people after a very long time um, of, of things that he had done that were in fitting um, in terms of running the biggest economy in the world, leading the biggest economy in the world. So um, it's hard to apologize, but, but guys, if you want to lead by example, you've got to apologize. And when you're wrong, you've got to take ownership of it. Um, and you know, listen, um, more than you speak, which sometimes for me is a bit difficult. So <laughs> I used to have in my team, I used to have my PA, um, who used to be my, um, she used to tell me what was happening and what I needed to know, not gossip, but, but what I needed to know. And then I had another plant that I would have, who, who was part of my team, who if I was carrying on too long, she would actually give me some signal to actually stop. So I think once you get to know the dynamics of your team, like you know who to trust to tell you where you stepping out of line. And if you do step out of line, and as Les said, she said something or she did something, you, you, you really need to own up and, and take responsibility. But leading by example, I think is one of the, 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 the traits that I think people see as very um, sort of old fashioned because today everyone sits in their bubble behind their computer and you know, you've know you got to walk the talk, you've got to walk the room, you've got to be visible to your customers. All of you here have customers and you're all very passionate about, about your customers and your relationships with customers. I mean, I know through COVID it's hard, but people need to see you, you need to, you need, your customers need to see your leadership quality. Um, and, and that's like seeing your customers. All of our top customers, customers are made sure at least twice a year as the CEO, I would make sure that I would have a personal visit to, to all of them. So, and you know, if you're doing that, your team does that. Um, and if you're reaching out, so we had a policy that within 24 hours of any customer complaint, if it was a serious complaint, um, and if, if it was one of our platinum customers and our high level frequent customers, I would actually pick up the phone. And as Les said, there's no better way than the old fashioned picking up the phone. It's two minutes, emails go bouncing backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and it gets lost in translation. There's nothing, we would never, our, our thing was, we would never let the sun go down and the sun set without apologizing to a customer, whether it was myself or one of my senior team, pick up the phone. And I promise you in our business, we had 25,000 cars. People would go mad if they found the slightest smell of smoke or if they found a little stick of a, I don't know, ice cream stick or something in the car, which is terrible. I agree. But um, just a telephone call. I mean, we used to give mints, imperial mints and the imperial cars. And I'll never forget the CEO of Tupperware um, one day. Um, I got a call from one of our branches and said, oh my God, we've got the CEO of Tupperware. He's standing in front of me at the kiosk and he broke his tooth. And he said, our peppermints are too hard. And instead of sucking, he flipping bit on the, on the mint and broke his tooth. He was standing in, our, in the kiosk saying, like, I've broken my tooth. I've just bitten into your mint. And like, Part of me wanted to say, like, oh my God, you're a 50 year old businessman, like grow up and like just deal with it. Why did you not suck and bite instead of, well, bite instead of suck? And, um, but I, 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 I said straight away, put me on the phone to him and I spoke to him and I said, listen, as soon as you get back to, because the head office was in Cape Town, as soon as you get back to Cape Town, um, go to the dentist and we'll pick up the bill. And I'm really, really sorry. It's a very good point. Um, and he said, you should have instructions on your mints. Um, so I didn't think that was appropriate. Can you imagine an instruction, please suck these? <laughs> it wouldn't have gone down very well, but um, <laughs> suck and not bite. So um, yeah, so I can give you many examples, but I'll hand over to, to Les in terms of confidence. We'll move on to the next one, thanks. I need to get the name of that secretary that had a sign for you. So the I secretary. Can <laughs> I can learn the sign. <laughs> I, I mean, there was this sign, like, like, 
Yeah. <laughs> and then there was this laksa wrapper uh, that didn't have lots of different And then we also had this sign, like if somebody was going like <laughs> that, I knew that there were a couple of people sleeping. <laughs> you are too funny. Okay, so um an another absolute um quality that I believe is so important with leadership is confidence and you know there's a i'm actually just looking for the saying the difference between confidence and arrogance because i think it is just so um i'm actually just going to read it to you right this second because it is so apt um but you know when you are confident people you, you know you people are believing in what you are doing and they can see and they want to lead they want to follow you but it's, it's when you're arrogant and that's when you telling other people like how great you are and I think you've got to understand the difference between the, the confidence and, and that arrogance, because being overconfident is also not good. So you've got to find that balance where, you know, people are looking up to you because they believe that you know what you're doing, you know where you, you're going, but without moving into that, you know, sort of cocky or more arrogant side of, side of the line. So I, I really believe that. And confidence inspires others to, to want to, to believe you and follow you and you know your product well so in in meetings when you are um consulting with your clients you know you've really got to show that confidence show that enthusiasm people love to see that kind of optimistic confidence kind of person and i think that the next point is actually on um positivity um, and so I, I'm going to actually almost do these two together because I do think that confidence and optimism or positivity go together. And I was on a, um, a call the other day with, with, with Bruce Whitfield um, of the Financial Mail, and he, he, he's just written a book called The Upside of Down. And he starts off his talk saying, you know, optimism and being optimistic is one of the greatest qualities of not only leaders but entrepreneurs because optimistic and confident and positive people believe that the future is better than the past and being positive and being um, optimistic I believe is is something that a entrepreneur and a leader has to be we've got to believe that the future is better than the past and you know a negative person never really built anything so whilst this has been such a tough time and um, it, it's been hard, it's been hard to be positive all of the time. But the one thing that I, that I must be honest with myself, I've never stopped believing that we would come through this. I've never stopped believing and seeing it as a glass half full rather than that glass half empty and being positive that this too shall pass. And you know, there's no point in being positive just for the sake of being positive. You're going to get down sometimes. That is absolutely normal. That is human nature. I'm not saying, you know, walk around and be a happy sort of go lucky Pollyanna. That's not what we're saying at all. But just having that, and I'm sure most of you have seen that chasing the sun, um, the beautiful um, Springbok rugby story, and, you know, how they just didn't lose hope, how they believed and how they were positive that they could actually you know, with their proper plan in place, with all the things that they did and having that positive attitude and then coming out, um, you know, on the winning side at the end of the day is just such a beautiful example of um, positivity, but positivity with a plan. Dawn, this is a great one for you. Thanks, Les. And, you know, I was very fortunate to surround myself with very good people. But um, in my early part of my of, of being an entrepreneur, because I was there at the beginning and I was very passionate about the business, I didn't want to let go. And I did employ people that um, I felt maybe um, I, I could actually <laughs> um, mold them into my thinking. And I think as you mature and as you learn, you, you, you discover that you need people that can complement you and people that are sometimes a lot smarter than you. And I was very young at the time. In fact, most of the people that I employed were, were a lot older than me. But really, you have to employ people, surround yourself with the best, best, best people and people that can challenge you. You know, challenge is a two-way street. 
it's not only you challenging people, it's about people challenging you. And I got to learn that um, the greatest people that, that I had on my team, who are most of them are still there, unfortunately, some over COVID have been retrenched. But, you know, I taught them all, well, I didn't teach them, but I encouraged them, should I say, um, and inspired them to, to, challenge, to challenge me. So I would often play devil's advocate, or I would throw out something that was totally ridiculous, just to see that I didn't have a couple of yes men or women. Um, there's nothing worse than having a team that are just going to say, yes, there's yes, don't. And, and just you don't want yes people. You want people to constantly challenge you. And I think that creates an environment conducive to success um, where people can see that it's, you know, like their views are heard and um Hiring people is, is, is not easy because, you know, when you hire them, you help them. And today you can't just get rid of people. I mean, you, you really can't. And I think one of the greatest failings um, in, in leadership is that you hire the wrong person, as Les says, and very often you do because there's, there's no real science. You can do all the assessments in the world, but there are some professional um, candidates out there that know what to say, when to say, how to um, how to um, add their their CVs, and there really are a lot of con artists out there. But I think that the biggest failing is that if it's and if it's a driver or if it's somebody, if they don't live to your values, and if they are not performing and they're letting the team down, really, guys, cut the reins sooner rather than later. And another big failure of leaders is that they don't release bad people early enough. And then what happens is that person is in your system a year, two years, three years. By seven years, it is almost impossible to get rid of them because by this stage, like they're integrated and they like, you know, so I think it's very important and we don't want to get rid of people. So firstly, it's our job to try and get them right. I mean, as a leader, it's, it's your job to make sure that they've got the adequate training, that you get mentors that can maybe mentor them. You can get, um, you know, well, as, as I always say, our um, institutional ambassadors. I mean, we used to have lots of um, cultural ambassadors in, in, in the team that um, they knew that they were there to be ambassadors for the culture. They were there to live the values and to share the values as, 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 as much as possible. So guys, hiring the right people is so important, but you've got to empower, you've got to let go, you've got to um, allow people to share their ideas and go along with their ideas. And there's nothing worse than those leaders that say, oh, we've done that before, we tried that three years ago and it doesn't work. Um, I think you've got to, and particularly now, the world has changed so much that we've got to really get new ideas coming. I mean, I know Simone, Les and I, Simone um, comes up with all these fresh ideas on social media, and she's certainly a hell of a lot better than, than, than myself and Les. And, you know, we want that, and we encourage people to actually say, no, I don't think this is great, or I, I think maybe this would work better. Um, so hiring great people is something that I must say that I was very, very blessed, and I did learn um, through a couple of mistakes in the early part of my career, but then rectified it, and and. I always say to people that one of my biggest blessings is when I decided to, to step down um, as the CEO, a role that I'd had for, like, I don't know, two, two three decades. Um, when I did decide to step down, and, you know, I used to do talks to women um, about how men create this glass ceiling. Sorry for the men on the, on the, um, on, that are online. But I used to talk and say, you know, there's this glass ceiling as women, like, how are we going to break this glass ceiling? And then, like, three years before I retired, like, I, I started to think about, like, you know, giving up, handing over the baton. And when I eventually did, and I looked around for a successor, I had seven potential successors in the different businesses to take over from me. Um, and there was, I mean, the person that took over from me was within, was within, and the person that has been appointed now worked for me for 18 years, and now he's taken over. So the legacy lives on, but the ideas and the way that they, they lead and manage are, 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 are very, very, very different. 
So um, I, th I think that's um, really something for you to, to think about. And I know we're running out of time. I'm very conscious of time. So I think if there are any questions on, you know, how do you hire the right people? How do you make sure that they, that they are going to fit into your culture? I think pop them into the chat box. And if we've got a second or two after, um, we'd be happy to, to answer it. But hiring people is probably the most challenging um, part of leadership, Les. I don't know if you'll agree with me. Um, and all of you, I hope that in, in three, four, five years' time, you've all got businesses employing lots of people um, because there's nothing better than seeing um, the growth in others. I prefer seeing others grow than seeing myself grow, but seeing people that, that have grown through your um, leadership or something that is, you know, some inspiration that you've been able to share is, is just the most rewarding and fulfilling thing. So make sure that um, when, you, when you start growing, so I once was told by a really, really, really top um, businessman in, in Johannesburg, he said, Dawn, you, the greatest leader, the greatest leader in a business is somebody that works himself out of a job in two years because you've got so many people pushing you that they eventually will push you out of your job. So be prepared that you've always only got, once you, you, you're leading a lot of people, that you've got two years. If it's more than that, then you're not a great leader because you should actually always have this abundance of, of people that um, are, are there to take over from you. So a great leader is one that builds a, a great strong team that can actually take over from you. And, We've got a session where we mentor and there's somebody in the mentoring session who's been left their business led um, by a family business. They've, they've just been like left. There's a, there was a family illness or something and she's just taken over this, this business. And it's very hard, you know, she's got a, it's a family business. Now she's got her family members watching her like a hawk in terms of her leadership qualities. And she's quite young-ish and she's never been in a leadership role before. And all of a sudden now, I mean, she was, she was having a great time um, working and now she's forced to actually be the entrepreneur, the leader, managing people, and um, she's in her 20s. So um, I think a, a, an example of the first thing she needs to do is make sure that she's got a great team beneath her and, you know, hold that, that position of power and strength. Um, because if she's a lot younger than her, her, her peers and the people around her, She's, she's going to come short. But let me move on to Les's last step, step seven. No, I, I think I just wanted to, um, to just close the loop on this. And I think it's, it's also about the system that you have in place. You know, when you, when you are hiring these great people, make sure that you are doing some sort of a personality test. Make sure that you just don't rush into these decisions. Make sure that you, you know, you're asking them the right questions because that can tell you a lot about person and make sure that they are aligned to your values. So, you know, you've really got to make sure that you've got a good process in place that you can hire the right, you know, don't only trust your gut feel, although I'm a big one for gut feel, but don't only Les, you disappeared there. Oh, okay. You go into the bedroom. Okay. Sorry, Les has got builders um, in her house and obviously they're getting very close. So Les, you are on sorry. mute. So we can sorry, hear sorry. you. Uh, and I, I explain to them what you were doing. As long <laughs> as your husband doesn't come around the cupboard <laughs> like you did the other day. <laughs> Yeah, no, so just make sure that you've got the right system in place. And I think that that is just so important. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, gut feel is important, but, um, you know, just make sure that you've got, you, you do some sort of a personality test and you, you, um, you have a system because I think that those can be very expensive mistakes in my experience. And then I think the last thing, just from a, from a leadership point of view, and this is something that I've really really kind of focused on a lot is that appreciation you know uh, people will work hard for you you know you spend more time at your office than you do often with your family you're spending eight hours a day you know at the office often I mean obviously now it's even more more difficult or, or slightly different but um, <laughs> you, you've got to find ways to show appreciation and that little whatsapp that email 
And what I've also found, and this was such a great tip, when I show appreciation for somebody in my team, I often show it on a group or in a group environment, you know, at a month end, or we have a, a thing called rate your mate, which is not something that I've um, and my exco team have voted for. It's something that the team have recognized in um, their colleagues. And it's such a beautiful way of each of us. And in fact, everybody votes for whoever you want to vote for in the entire team. And I actually end up reading the entire list. That And it's peer-to-peer -peer and about each person showing appreciation for each other. And often it's departmental, but then the one who gets the most votes get a, gets a little 250 rand voucher from um, Woolies or whatever the case may be. And it's just that small appreciation that goes such a long way. So not only does that show appreciation, but it also builds culture. And that's another thing that um, is so massively important when you start building your businesses, when you, you, know, you start growing, you've got to think about what is the culture of the business that I'm wanting to, um, to have because you know, strategy um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what, what are the things that are keeping people at your business? What are the things that are keeping people working for you? So not only leadership, but how through your own leadership can you build a great culture and you know, show appreciation for the, those people that are helping you also on your journey to build something that has purpose um, and not just you know working for for the money. So yeah, I think on that um, on that happy note, uh, we are very happy to um, take questions because I think there's there's a lot, and uh, and I always actually my favorite part of all of these sessions is normally the end where we can all chat to you guys and just hear your thoughts and have your questions. So over to to all of you. Please let us know if there any anything you wanted to chat to us. So Dawn, you on mute? Delegation, yes. Dawn, 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 you on mute now? So, there we go. Um, I thought there was a question here from um, Perti about <laughs> delegation. She's comfortable delegating, but um, difficulties when people don't complete what they have undertaken. What strategies um, would you recommend? So that's bound to happen because obviously your expectations are very high. I'm sure they are. Um, and, and it's very difficult for people to actually all of a sudden come into a business or be in a business and, and get to that level. But I, I would say that you need to work through and you need to give them a chance. So, so I always give somebody a first chance. I give them a second chance, but I actually don't ever give them a third chance. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm quite a hard, um, you know, like... It, it must be done, uh, you know, the way that that and it must be done. And as long as you can justify the reasons for doing it that way, and as long as you're very specific with them in terms of what they're not doing, you know, where they're failing, and maybe give them one or two suggestions on how they can actually improve in those areas, because very often it could just be a, like a total misunderstanding. Or it could be that, you know, to you it's important, but to them it's not important. So you need to, to sort of realign what is important to you and why it's important to you um, with them. Um, so does that help? Does that help at all? Yeah, no, it does help. I think, um, yeah, I think it is quite hard because you're like dealing with adults. And so I have the same expectation that, you know, all of us are on the same page and so it will get done. And often it doesn't. And that's where I do struggle in terms of communicating this, actually. And so that's when I'll just do it myself versus, um, yeah, try to ensure that somebody else does it. It's sometimes easier. So it's a little bit like with your children. Um, the effort to actually correct them, um, it's easier just to overlook it. But actually, um, you know, the learning is in the correcting. And it's the way, obviously, that you correct in a gentle fashion. The first time, I'm happy to be very gentle. Second time, I'll be maybe a little bit more forceful. Third time, like, you know, guys, this cannot happen again. Um, this is where we have to really draw the right. line. Otherwise, you know, we need to, we need mm. to look at a different um, career opportunity for you. But I'm, <laughs> also, yeah, I think, you know, feedback is a gift. Uh, and, you, you know, that's how we learn and grow. I mean, we've got to be very firm on um, 
on, on certain things, which means sometimes you do have to be very um, hard ass on, on, on things. And, you know, we have to sometimes have exit strategies for people that don't work. Sorry, Les, um, you were trying to, you were saying- No, 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 it's, no, I think, you know, giving feedback and if, even if you position it like that, and we have the saying in our business as well, feedback is a gift because you cannot learn and grow without getting that feedback. And I mean, Dawn and I also have that, you know, open communication where I think she's going on too long or she thinks that I'm, you know, and I think it is about being transparent, but being empathetic and, um, and doing it in a nice way as well making sure that you've set the expectation, making sure that they're trained properly, but then holding them to that. And if they don't do what you're wanting them to do, ask them why. Right. You know, you knew what your, your deadline was. You understood, um, you know, we went through this. You understood what needed to be done. What happened? And I right. think it's, you know, when you ask them what happened, you know, wh why did you fail here? And how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? I think that that's important. Right. No, thanks. Sorry, let me unmute myself. Any other questions before we maybe hand over to Lisa to, to close the session? Anything else that anyone wants? But otherwise, um, you're welcome to put them forward. Uh, maybe I'll just share a comment on positive thinking because it's part of what I do also. And, you know, often we think it's this magic science in terms of you think positive, you feel better, but actually when you look at the science behind it, it's quite fascinating. So what happens when we believe in our own ability to get something done? And like I was saying the last time, you know, I can believe it, I understand it cognitively, you don't always relate to it on a very um, tangible level either sometimes. But what happens when we believe we can get things done is we start taking the steps to get it done. And I often use marathon running as my example because I can't run a marathon. I've decided I'm not going to run a marathon. I don't buy the running shoes. I don't run a kilometer done, right? If I thought I could run a marathon, I would take those small steps to start learning a marathon. And then when I failed, if I believed I could do it, I would think, what do I need to adjust to succeed? If I fail thinking I absolutely can't do it, I think this is me. I don't have the skill. I don't have the capability. And that belief system then just completely limits what you're able to achieve. And I know not as simplistic all the time, but it really is quite a powerful uh, factor in, in what we end up doing. Mm. Very good point. And thanks for sharing that with us. And as you say, um, you know, being positive is there's no science to it, um, but there's also no blueprint around being a good or bad leader. Um, and I think all of these things, you know, there's no blueprint about um, being a good entrepreneur or being a bad entrepreneur. So I think it's learning by, by, by trial and error, but I love your analogy of the sprint, uh, the, 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 the running. I love that analogy. Uh, can I use it? <laughs> Please. <laughs> but, but, Katie, I mean, it is a, the most brilliant example. And I mean, I actually ended up running the New York Marathon three years wow. ago when I, when I actually, honestly, you know, I mean, earlier on in my life, I would, I mean, I'm not a runner. I'm certainly not a marathon runner, but it was something that I wanted to do because I knew it was hard because I knew no running a business is hard. And I was like, I'm doing this. And a hand on heart, it's one of the best things I've ever done in my life. It's one of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned. And when you want something badly enough, mm -hmm. I promise you, you will absolutely put mm -hmm. your heart and soul into that. And I wanted that medal and I managed to run the New York Marathon and it was the most, you know, best day of my life. One of the best days of my life. Definitely top Sounds five. Sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is amazing. But yeah, just when you believe and you, you, you know, you, uh, that be, I mean, exactly. When you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah. Guys, thank you all. It's been great. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoy these sessions because not only, I mean, the learning, as I say, challenge, challenging learning is always a two-way street. And um, I think it's, it's great for all of us just to share experiences because I think that's the best way that we learn. So thank you all very much and have a beautiful weekend. Um, and thank you. I'll see you next week. The next week is... Um, for the business plan. So we're gonna bring everything together. So it's um, Indigo level. So we're actually gonna go back now 
We're going to revisit your vision and your missions. We're going to revisit your sales plan. We're going to revisit your marketing. We're going to make sure that everything's aligned. And we're going to hopefully come out with some sort of a, a you know, two to three year plan that we've put in place that you can go and take your business forward. And the, some of the goals that you want to reach in the next six, 12, 18 months and beyond. So that's what next week is all about, is bringing everything together. So thank you, guys. Can't wait. See you Bye, guys. Bye-bye.